फिर से करो इन एवरी हार्ट बीट ऑफ लाइफ there's a story and a lot of times when you talk about holding space is also that that corner of self validation what are you really made of and who you really are with each shared experience there is an invitation to each one of you to introspect to question how does this resonate with you my zest to kind of participate in a lot of these extracurricular activities kind of stemmed from there join us as we dive into tales that feel the written from the pages of our own lives but i just want to go and test myself think okay hey, you know how can i do this you know how do i do this what what will come out of it reflect on each narrative and ponder how these tales mirror your own journey because in every shared story there's a spark waiting to ignite your own path of personal transformation this is saujanya your host welcoming you to our new series the change catalyst from attitude me so shri i've always uh... been in awe of your resilience creativity and your zesty humor in that short duration that i've known you and i think in today's conversation i like to walk through your journey and in this process i'd love to know you better and uh, for my audience in this process i'd like to sort of pick up these uh, gems through your journey that one could reflect Uh, inspire and also make corrective actions or take the right actions in their own journeys uh, because i think you're a complete transformative voice and an inspiration that the world needs to hear so welcome on board to attitude makeover and thank you so much for making this time for me thank you sojanya it's lovely being here and i think the point that you made on gems through the journey it has a nice ring to it um but um i would say you know i i would love to share some things that i've learned over a period of time by meeting different people and uh, through the different phases of my life and the influence that they've had because i strongly feel that uh, you know the life we live is basically a collective influence of uh, many things and many people coming together at different points of time oh absolutely uh, lovely being here i look forward to this thank you thank you So Shreya, I always yeah. start with uh, early years, and the reason mm. I start with early years um, of my guest is it sort of really gives a glimpse about their individuality in a lot of ways because that sort right. of becomes a foundation. You might have evolved, changed, uh, did course corrections, but the early years give a good glimpse of who you are as well. Uh, yeah. What were early years for you like? Yeah, I was um, born in the mid '80s. It was a great music scene uh, everywhere in the world, but uh, in in one southern city of Chennai, I was born there. Um, you know, exported to Bombay in about a month's time from the time I was born, and um, my parents um, have always been, uh, you know, uh, looking at different, like looking life. Taking life in their own stride, right? So my my dad was um, his family over a period of time has traveled to different parts of India uh, because my grandfather had like a government job and it it took him to different cities. So they've been in Delhi, they've been in Bombay, they've been in Chennai. So my dad came in nineteen seventy eight, um, pretty much trying to start off his own um, you know life, uh, you know working through different organizations and ranks, and then my mom. uh she's always been in chennai very contrasting in a way um you know uh, she was probably coming to bombay for the first time um and it was a huge change for her um you know uh, both culturally linguistically uh, and in many ways and you know i was born um uh, in chennai but you know pretty much completely brought up in bombay um i was born with with an eye condition which was not something that um was recognized you know at, at maybe in the first 2 to 3 months or uh, even a year for that matter um but suddenly i had the squint in the eye which which medically they call it nystagmus um where the 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 squint continues on it doesn't rest 
and um, after showing it to multiple doctors it kind of they they ran multiple tests and they also deduce that you know it's just not limited to nystagmus but it is also um, a condition of the retina um, and for all you know I, I don't mean to uh, sound like the the Merriam Webster of uh, medicine but uh, the um, uh, the problem, the, the the role of the retina is basically to absorb what you see the, and, and build a perception um, yeah. that gets transmitted to the brain. So I had problems at two levels. One, um, the part where the anything that you see comes in contact for the first time and it gets into a place where people can translate an object into, you know, giving it a name. Mm. Uh, that that part on the retina was completely patched up and then you know the nerve that connects the retina to the brain which is called the optic nerve um, that was very weak and that has just been weak over the years and it just gotten deteriorated over a period of time so it's not that I was born completely blind but I was always born with an eye condition and it has kind of deteriorated you know as as the years uh, went on but I would say the the a couple of points that that you touched upon, you know, at the start of the conversation on resilience, uh, you know, being one of them. Um, I think a lot of my resilience, in fact, is a borrowed uh, loan, if you may, <laughs> from my parents, right? Because think about somebody who has, you know, probably doing their best to kind of go and have conversations with different doctors and, you know, pretty much touring uh, to just figure out cure for different conditions. And, you know, every time you meet a different doctor, they have a different perspective on the condition as well. Uh, for them to really, you know, live through all that and at the same time not let the morale fall down. So I think I, I owe a lot of that resilience to them mm. uh, over the years. And the other part that kind of, you know, strengthens my resolve, uh, you know, and, and, and something has that has played a very critical part um, in my upbringing is the, um, the, the whole sense of inclusion, right? So today we talk about inclusion as, you know, something that is, um, uh, you know, a must have something that needs to be ingrained in the culture and so on. And, and I saw that glimpses of inclusion right from the early age when, uh, you know, despite the eye condition, I was, you know, part of an integrated school. And just for the benefit of, uh, you know, people who are not close, very close to the education system uh, and the Indian culture, a lot of the um, people with eye condition, people who are either partially blind or completely blind, there is an option for people to join blind schools, right? So where yeah. uh, everybody around have a visual uh, impairment, it becomes like a, um, a collective learning of sorts. Yeah. And integrated school is basically, uh, you know, um, a school where you have people from different uh, cultures, different abilities and all of that, which is basically what in normal parlance uh, everybody would relate to when someone talks about schooling. So I would say uh, I was put in an integrated school and I think that's probably the best first or first of many good decisions that probably, you know, my parents made at that time and that kind of just sowed the seeds of uh, one uh, realizing what your potential is as an individual um, in the collective uh, of many people mm -hmm. and the second thing is allowing you to find your own space um, in an environment where everybody is trying to do the same thing and everybody has a different way of looking at things right so um, talk about that whole diverse way of approaching things is something that that kind of I I think some of my early years um, really played a very strong part in that. True, true. A couple of questions here. I think uh, yeah. I told you when we connected recently that for me uh, I was exposed to this very early on because my dad was diabetic and I saw right. the eyesight uh, going off and. Mm. I feel like one of the most important things is holding space. Yeah. Right? It looks like it was not just holding space that was happening at home. It was also mm -hmm. around you, whether it's in school, your circle, 
of friends, yeah. of social self. And for yourself, you were holding space for yeah. yourself as well. Was that something yeah. that your parents sort of guided you through or how did that evolve? Yeah, I think um, I love this concept of holding space, right? Because it, it kind of gives you, um, you know, that both that elevation and, and the spectrum to really mm-hmm. say that, hey, how much, uh, you know, what is space in the first place, right? What is the space that you really want to hold? Uh, and and the way I interpret that is in two to three different ways, right? So one is um, when I look at the opportunity to really define my own space, that is something that I got from my early times, right? So um, I, I always was a kid who was, uh, you know, who, who always looked for different ways to uh, express in the way, in, in the sense that, not necessarily saying that, hey, I want to go and talk about, you know, the, the current affairs or politics or whatnot, but different ways of just making my own creative self, you know, be in that position of expressing, right? So it mm-hmm. could be, you know, participating and, you know, as, as uh, rudimentary as, you know, fancy dress competitions or uh, elocution or, you know, debates or, you know, essay writing and stuff. Um, and somewhere it also, I think, instill that, um, piece of a healthy competition, right? And 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 a lot of times when you talk about holding spaces, also that that corner of self validation, yeah, right. So what do you? What are you really made of, and who you really are? Um, and I think my my zest to kind of participate in a lot of these extracurricular activities kind of stemmed from there. Mm. Right, it was not necessarily hey, I want to win a first prize in something, or I want to win a second prize. I just want to go and test myself, saying that hey, you know, how can I do this? You know, how do I do this? What what will come out of it? And mm. you know, um, how do I look at myself? Because when I look at my parents' role in this, um, I think the the most critical role that they played was um, allow me to find my space. Firstly, and the second thing that they did was once I you know, figured out these different tenets of, you know, like learning music, for example, or, you know, um, wanting to go on picnics and stuff. Mm. Um, They also kind of backed it up. And and I think that is very critical because at that point, um, they were also figuring out where do I fit in, in the external world. And it was very critical for the both of us to really look at uh, saying that, hey, um, it is one of those uh, times where we really need to be open to whatever life throws at us and not really, you know, stay in a prism or put ourselves into a prism, um, you know, which will just kind of hamper our own understanding of where we can get to. Yeah. yeah. So we, in some yeah. ways, become our own inhibitors of our journey as a yes. result of that, right? Yes. We are the passengers and the ticket collectors. Absolutely. We play both roles. Absolutely. <laughs> 80s music tell me what were you listening to ah that's interesting right so um i i always say this if someone comes and says that hey you know tell me your favorite artist it's so tough it is so tough i'm like you know just kind of bring down the genre let's kind of narrow down the genre to the maximum possible and then figure out you know who are the, some of the artists that 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 are top of mind for me rather than my you know my favorites so in my early, uh, this thing, my, my dad used to have these, um, you know, a lot of these cassettes of mm. MS Lakshmi. So there was a lot of uh, Karnatak music at home. Mm. And he would get this from his brother-in-law. Uh, he used to work in Dubai and, you know, they would do, they would kind of, you know, make these tapes, uh, cassette tapes and uh, recordings and, you know, share with everybody and so on. So MS Subalakshmi, Esudas, uh, you know, um, uh, Velukudi Krishnan, oh. uh, a lot of the instrumental stuff on, uh, you know, Shivram and, uh, and and so on. Like, quite a few stuff. And then, my dad had these two cassettes of Boney M, right? And I have no clue, uh, you know, uh, how did, um, you know, uh, disco and pop really found place in, uh, you know, Carnatic music uh, library of sorts. <laughs> but it was a good uh, surprise, I would say. Uh, and then, you know, obviously a little bit of Bollywood did have a rub-off effect considering that, you know, you have a lot of peers in school 
who do kind of you know watch a lot of movies and um, you know listen to a lot of the commercial pop and the bollywood songs mm. there on on the other side in the early 2000s i i i kind of ventured into my junior college and the senior year and um, you know the graduation and so on which is where um, you know i got exposed to a lot of um, you know the western classic rock uh, you know phase of my life i would call it so it had everything from you know the the beatles from the early 60s to led zeppelin from the late 60s and early 70s uh, and then it had iron maiden coming in towards late 70s and early right. 80s red hot chili peppers in the 90s so you know it 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 just opened up uh i don't know i think it it's probably the the best time i would say my junior college and senior college year because it just expanded my understanding of music uh you know beyond genres right yeah. so i wasn't really in that prism of saying that hey i listen to only pop music or whatever so um i moved from rock then moved to jazz the charlie parker years and wow. you know the john coltrane years the the you know the early to mid 50s and the early 60s and then you had miles davis and the marvishno orchestra and so on and so forth and then because i was also learning tabla at that time when i was in my college years and the late schooling years mm. and um, that got me thinking on you know how do we really interpret rhythm because uh you know we we keep time signatures we we tr- try to measure everything by you know the time that that we spend towards it but also when i look at the rhythm patterns of a certain style of music versus the other uh how intricate that they can get you know and how complex they can be and how simply you can express them yeah. so yeah i can go on and on and on i think you know we can talk for 3 days uh, if we need to kind of you know go in depth with all the kinds of music that we have been looking at well i can yeah. uh, resonate with this i i think um, so for me early years my mom used to play uh, ms subalakshmi in the morning mm. you know i used to yeah. um, rewrite the songs um hmm. like i have you have that kaushalya supradha ramateja correct yeah i changed it yeah. to saujanya supradha ramateja namaste oh my god <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so i I, and, i don't know if there were any copyright police at that time coming in <laughs> <laughs> but mom had a hard time with that she would be like you're spoiling the song hmm. a big part of my growing up was also about books and movies um hmm. because in order to yeah. shape you in order to hold space for yourself and True. to explore and go through discovery there are different avenues for me one of it is books and movies um hmm. were you watching movies how do you watch movies yeah because back then i don't know if you had a lot of braille books either right yeah a lot of my um you know early times uh was around spent around uh watching a lot of sports Oh. and um when i say watching a lot of sports because when i was in my um you know till about uh, i think i can't you know trap them in years but uh, like when i was in the 6th grade 7th grade etc i could still see a little bit of um, you know uh, a content on tv mm. and because of which i could easily figure out and i could place the fielders in a cricket field and place the players on a tennis court and so on mm. so and and then i would be very fascinated with commentary right so uh, you know i i i would always look at you know the the tony greggs and the michael holdings of the world and you know really look at how they kind of bring a story alive so it's it's basically you know uh, you know any kind of sport itself happening on ground is a story by itself and then you add another layer to it it was just fascinating and and i would listen to a lot of commentary there when it comes to tennis uh, you know uh, vijay amritraj is still uh, like the vintage yeah. uh, you know voice that you would see uh, you know whether it's wimbledon or any other uh, uh, grand slam courts yeah. um and formula 1 was the other one because it 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 had that 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 very familiar sound of the race car mm. and you know there were a couple of uh, steve slate and chris goodwin uh, were a couple of great commentators at that point of time who literally brought the story alive so a lot of my um uh input i would say from uh, you know content standpoint was very auditory mm. um and on the on on when it comes to books uh, you know i my um my 
introduction or my date with books was very late in life, right? So, uh, and I'll tell you the reason why, because when I would do my, um, you know, the regular course for, for school, etc., it would always be my mom recording them into tapes. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, these would be lessons and the, and the question and answers, etc. Whatever we would get, she would just record it in the tape. So I didn't want to really bother her with saying that, hey, here's a book. Can you read me something outside, you know, out of syllabus <laughs> in that sense, right? Yeah. Uh, because I didn't want to. I was very conscious of the amount of time that she was giving to me. And she was giving more than I deserve at that point of time. And um, it, it wasn't, in, in my head, it wasn't right. Um, you know, to kind of burden her with more. Um, the first book I ever read from page to page, which is again in my mom's voice and not, um, you know, uh, through any software, mm. uh, was A Lot of the Rings, right? And this was my 12th standard, post 12th standard, you know, you used to be privileged to get about two to three months of vacation time at that point of time. I don't know how much kids get these days. Yeah. But um you know, my mom read a lot of the rings. So we spent a month, morning and evening, two hours uh, in the morning, two hours in the evening, just going through the works of Tolkien, right? And and that was my first book that I read. Um, then I I kind of got myself, uh, you know, learning the screen reader, right? Uh, and a screen reader. Um, is is very simply put a software that kind of reads out everything that comes up on your um, computer screen and uh, your phone mm. right and at that point um, you know i used to you know I, I still use jaws as a software uh, which is a screen reader for desktops and i was learning it and then you know i got some ebooks from a couple of my friends and the first two books were uh, uh, dracula and frankenstein right oh, wow. um, you know Talk about uh, death metal and uh, you know, <laughs> Graham Stroker, uh, you know, uh, making a connection. But um, yeah, and, and I loved Dracula, right? I, I was fascinated by it, not because it was a horror thing. It was something that was absolute fictional or whatever. I just loved the way it was written. It had, it had a beautiful lettering style. Plus, you know, how do you connect you know, the, the present with the past and, you know, how do you bring a story alive? So um, that was my first book that I read. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, reading books in different ways, screen reader ma- was my only preferred choice, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there were a couple of other options. One was reading, you know, learning and reading Braille. And the second one was audiobooks. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing with reading Braille was, again, um, A few of the special educators tried to teach me Braille very early on during my schooling time. They they thought it would be very easy for me to kind of, you know, uh, manage my own things and, you know, get around stuff. But I didn't have the patience then to really learn Braille um, because um, it's a completely different script uh, that that you need to look, uh, you know, read through. Uh, It it involved a lot of, uh, you know, navigating those... um, navigating your fingers through the dots mm. on the paper. And, uh, you know, I I, I I didn't mind writing in Braille, but I, I, I didn't have the patience, to be very honest, to, you know, read Braille. So, and, and because of which, I, it never caught on with me. Mm. Um, and, and hence, you know, and I, I realized much later in my life that I should have probably given some time, um, you know, towards learning Braille, especially when it came to taking notes during meetings, right? And, and, um, but again, I think uh, hindsight is, you know, always, um, you know, it, it comes with own bonuses. Yeah. But um, uh, so Braille is something that I never got on to. Audiobooks was another one where, um, you know, I, I, I've i tried listening to audiobooks over a period of time. Um, you know, in fact, a couple of uh, great books in the recent times. And is movies part of your thing right now or... Yes, 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 yes. In fact, uh, movies has another, uh, they, they have another, you know, aspect of mine that, that kind of got tested. And, um, you know, I've, I've learned over a period of time to kind of build more patience for movies. Because, you know, with um, I, I, I would always find it easy to catch 
you know, like an episode of Seinfeld or, you know, an episode of uh, Frasier, which would probably be like, you know, 20 minutes, 22 minutes in, you know, plus breaks. Mm. Um, and and that would always become like a very short burst of time that I could spend towards that. And, and whenever I would think of movies, I'm like, I can't sit for three hours at one place and, you know, watch movies. Like, you know, how do I do that? Um, but I think over the years, what has happened is... Um, uh, content specifically with OTT coming in, uh, there's a lot of content which has become very accessible. Yeah. And when I say accessible in the context of movies, I'm talking about, uh, you know, audio descriptions uh, for some other movies, right? Where uh, you have a scene, you have a dialogue, but you also have a lot of scenes without dialogues. Yeah. And, you know, and, and some of these scenes have a lot of either motion sequence, which is, which is in a very silent way, or a lot of uh, picturesque sceneries and so on. Yeah. And audio description basically just narrates those and, and it gives you context of hey, where somebody is coming in when they are, you know, uh, pitching in their dialogues. So Netflix um, and to a certain extent, even Amazon Prime these days, uh, they have a lot of movies and uh, TV series with audio descriptions that kind of just helps me keep along uh, with, the, with the plot overall. So um Although I, I still need to find some time to catch some of the latest movies, um, but I'm I'm kind of you know uh, anything with Tom Hanks is is a huge uh, like it's it's a default. I need to watch it. Yeah. Um, that comes easy to me. Anything with Morgan Freeman is another one. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just find it easier. A little bit of Jack Nicholson here and there. Um, you know, so those are the kind of uh, uh, spaces that I I broadly look into. Yeah. I feel like I'm talking to my Bichidawa brother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. I, I still need to get used to death metal though. I tried oh. death metal for a very long time, but I don't know how to kind of you know, I, work I my way through I don't know. People it. say, I, how do you, this is noise. It's amazing. Hmm. I, I sort of, uh, you know, there are days when I'd like to just listen to the drums. There are days when I'd hmm. like to just listen to... Um, the voice, the vocals, uh, yeah, and I think uh, especially death metal. Uh, hmm. In a lot of ways, it's helped me maneuver through phases of life. Right. Um, right. I can't explain how it stood uh, through the test of time for me, sure. uh, but it was my. Uh, I enjoyed it because the way. Hmm. Um, the poetry was in that and people like, may not read yeah. me with it but I find True. a lot of poetry in it and I had a lot of True. friends who were um, you know really in the same space listening to these True. Uh, death metal songs and, and and I always get fascinated uh, with you know learning the perspective behind music yes. right so you know why do you what what does this music make you do yeah. Uh, you know, where did it get started? Like the, the, the backstory yeah. of the of the tune, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is where, uh, you know, um, a lot of artists and, and I, I kind of would do this with, with, with a lot of artists even now that I would immediately go and look up, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, the Wikipedia page or, you know, their, their entire discography and, you know, what what kind of led to what in that sense. And I think um, that is where uh, a large part of early 2000s, um, the role of radio uh, in my life has been has been invaluable. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you can obviously walk into, you know, uh, Planet M or, you know, in Bombay, we used to have Rhythm House, etc. to get a CD. Yeah. But the, the amount of storytelling or, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, how probably Elvis came to be who Elvis was and, you know, how did he go around, um, you know, to different places and, you know, build his charisma and how did he feel when Beatles came to the US for the first time and so on and so forth. That is something that a CD sleeve is not going to tell you, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And that is where I think there's a lot of story that, you know, uh, people who are fans and who are not fans either, who are just listeners of music, uh, they kind of bring to the floor and I love that. I love that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, I also think it's been a foundation for me when I started Attitude Makeover because for me, yeah, my process of learning is not just books. It's not just interacting with others. It's a whole lot of yeah. 
it's a combination of all of this. Now, in this yeah. journey, Shri, I believe mm. technology has been your sort of uh, your bestie in your exploration yes. and your discovery process. Um, yeah. Are you a natural with it? Were you introduced to it very naturally, or how does that happen? Yeah. I think it became a, a necessity to start with. Um, yeah. I'm not a like I I love technology, but I'm not somebody who would you know go and unbox the latest phones or you know who would be edgy to go and figure out hey you know um, you know for a lack of better association how do you uh, land jailbreaks on phones yeah. and so on. Mm-hmm. But I think it, it started with a necessity. Um, it, it was a screen reader to start with that I kind of got my hands on. Um, then it kind of went on to different applications, which is, you know, image to text, text to image, uh, a lot of apps on the phone. Uh, for example, if you need to book a cab or order some food, etc. you know, how do you get your work around? So I think a lot of um, the uh, exploration has been defined by the routine, mm. but also that routine has given a, a space to me where I'm saying that, hey, if I need to go and get something done myself, I need to figure this out. Yeah. Right. Because one of the perceptions that, you know, um, a lot of them would have, and this again goes back to the point on you know, a certain perception that people hold or, you know, the space that they hold themselves about yeah. others, right, is to say that, hey, you know, if, if there is somebody with a disability, they will always need help, Yeah. right? And um, I've always tried and I, and I tried, I, tr- I still try very hard every day to uh, see what are the additional things that I can do myself. Right. Uh, even if it means that going from one place to the other, booking my own cab, you know, getting my things around, arranged in a way that I want and, you know, just managing my own work. Uh, I figure out technology as an aid uh, which will help me get there. Yeah. yeah. But that is not to say that, you know, I look at technology only as, you know, um, a best case concierge. Right. I look at technology as uh, something that I can passionately learn and talk about, right? So um, when when I work uh, the, the way I do using a screen reader, I also talk about, you know, how can one use a screen reader and how do I go about um, working on, an, on, on Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Word or, you know, send an email. Uh, you know, how do I make sure that, you know, something that I write is without uh, spelling errors or, you know, mm. uh, basic things but you know a lot of times what happens is that opens up the mindset of people who would always think that hey uh, if, if it is somebody who is blind who uh, you know who is working in um, and and you know it's, it's a very funny story that it, it it used to be a perception for the longest period of time that if you are blind and you know the profession that you would choose is to be a telephone operator Mm-hmm. Right. And because at that time, telephone uh, telephones used to have big keys and, you know, you could just feel, you know, get your way around with the numbers and, um, you know, the the the, con- the 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 layout of the phone and so on. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, there used to be this thing on, hey, if, if there is somebody who is blind, they would probably be a telephone operator. Mm-hmm. Or if there is somebody who is blind, uh, are you in HR yeah. as a function? Yeah. Right. So a lot of associations and and in all fairness, this is not because of people didn't choose to. In a lot of situations, these are, uh, you know, the perceptions are an outcome of, you know, the lack of um, uh, want to be aware. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, and I always say this, if you are intentional about knowing and doing things, you will end up doing things. And doing oh, I love things, it. Right? Yeah. If you're not intentional about it, you're not going to do it. Yeah. And and I tell this to myself as well. And, and you know, uh, because I, I would create these different uh, goals for myself, saying that hey, I need to go write X number of words in a year. Mm-hmm. I need to go, you know, travel for so many music festivals and so on. But oftentimes, I, even I wouldn't follow through on some of those goals. But um, 
it is very important that people are intentional about it. Yeah. And that is where um, the way I look at technology is to say that it's, I'm not trying to prove a point to anybody anymore. Right? There was a time when I was trying to prove a point to get myself in somewhere. Uh, whether it was in college or it was in my first job or it was in my, you know, uh, getting into an MBA college, uh, you know, um, yeah, probably moving roles within an organization and so on and so forth. There was a time when I, I felt the need to continuously keep validating myself. Yeah. But today, I probably do the same thing. I, whenever I talk to a new person, I, I do say that, hey, this is, what, this is how I go about it. These are certain couple of challenges is how I work around it. But I don't talk about it from the position of, hey, you, um, you know, it's better you know about this. Mm. I come from the position of, you know, it's good for you to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, so it, it has become a good to know versus a must know yeah. uh, kind of a thing. Because I, I've realized that a lot of times when, uh, especially when we talk about technologies like AI and um, you know, um, augmented reality and so on and so forth. Um, there is a lot of surround sound on, hey, what technology can do. But I think there needs to be much more um, stories or much more conversations that we need to have around how different people use the same technology in different ways. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and I see that as a great opportunity for myself to go and have conversations with people to say that hey you may be probably using you know word microsoft word in a certain way but here are three different ways i'm using it you know mm -hmm. is that something that's going to help you yeah. in your how inclusive is india vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world in sort yeah. of to your point it's not mm -hmm. just about awareness i i think it's important for someone to want to become aware right and yeah. therein comes the change um for someone like me who's traveled i always look yeah. at uh, i think all of us do that as a comparison of why is it different in another country and then why is it so much more right. cleaner why is it so much more um you know right. friendlier i think in, i think we live in a beautiful country but when you travel have you hmm. seen what the best inclusive space looks like vis-a-vis -vis right. what you experience here? Right. I, I think, I'll tell you, uh, I sometimes struggle with this, right? Um, because I, we often hear about, hey, the West, especially the Americas being way more inclusive in terms of the infrastructure and, you know, as compared to India. And, um, I don't think it's true mm. um, and and for a few reasons right and again and I'm, I'm, I'm coming from the vantage point that I see uh, you know how we kind of um, because for every person irrespective of their ability and disability their uh, approach and perspective to the location or the places that they visit is going to be very different. Yeah. Right, and their expectations is going to be are going to be very different. Yeah. So the way I look at it is, um, I feel uh, infrastructure is one part of it, which obviously we do have a lot of work to do, um, and so does a lot of other countries. So do a lot of other countries, right? Because it's very easy to say that hey, you know, if you have a very accessible metro in in a city in the U.S. or you know Europe, mm. they are way more accessible may not be true because for example you know even to get to that metro you need to have enough buses and public transport right which probably india has in you know abundance of yeah um once you figure out the connection the last mile and the first mile that we talk about we also need to look at you know how are people who are uh, delivering those services are they inclusive or not mm -hmm. right because a lot of times uh, infrastructure, the way I think about it, is probably, you know, 30 to 40% of the solution that you can make accessible. 
But the remaining 50 to 60 percent is still people that coexist or co-travel with us, yeah. right? Uh, uh, think of airline ground staff. You know, are they sensitized enough to support persons with disabilities, right? Because it's not about uh, airports having ramps. It's about what happens when there are no ramps. You still have enough surface area to cover from your boarding counter to the airline. Yeah. Right. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, when you look at trains, it's very easy to say that, hey, you know, um, if, if trains have uh, voice commands, people will get it. But, you know, does anyone, you know, know how to get to the place where they can get into the train, right? How easy that path is. Yeah. And I'll give you a very interesting example, you know, um, something that I encountered very recently, like a couple of months ago in India. Uh, there are a lot of the uh, the metro lines, um, metro train lines coming up in Bombay uh, mm. recently, right? And I traveled by the metro after a very, very long time and um, probably the first time in, in that, the, the newly created line uh, that got inaugurated about a year ago or so. Mm. And I realized that the, um, the way to get from the place, from the road, uh, you know, from the footpath of the road to the train is a maze, right? How do you decode that maze? Because there are no, there are there are tactile um, floorings, which, and, yeah. and, you know, a tactile flooring is basically uh, tiles on the floors, which have straight lines or certain designs, which indicate or which help a visually impaired person walk in that straight line or the direction that they want to take. Yeah. But the, the problem is um, nobody knows that, you know, uh, where to turn because those lines will keep going. And, you know, w w how do you get to an escalator or, you know, which escalator do you need to take and wh where do you go? So which is where there is a lot of human intervention. And, you know, when, when I kind of uh, when we were talking about technology a little while ago, one of the most important things is our technology is not going to solve for your life. Yeah. It is about you and technology working together to work your life out, right? An enabler. And that is where I see, you know, infrastructure is just part of the whole this thing. And we often get a little carried away when we talk about countries and infrastructure to say that, hey, they are not accessible. You know, I, I get this even now saying that, hey, why didn't you come to the US? Uh, you know, it's going to be uh, way more easier for you, right? But... It may not necessarily be because, you know, uh, probably I don't have enough bus services or the frequency that, that mm. we probably have in India to go from one place to the other. You know, the cost is another factor. You know, how do you figure out the, you know, how uh, economical a certain mode of transport will be in one country versus the other, mm. right? I think I see two points there that I want to mm. sort of see if it makes sense. Um, having worked as a developer, as an engineer early on, yeah. we normally sort of build on very simple use cases that we are familiar with. I think it's very right. important. This is where I want to become aware and thereby mm. there are additional use cases like you talked about that I need okay. to be thinking of. Right? Yeah, and I think that that's a very important point. Right? There's the openness to yeah. exploring. Yeah. And, and and the very fact to realize that a solution is never done. Yeah. It's always a work in progress. Yeah. So, yeah, very well, true. One thing I realized, uh, Shri, uh, and, and I love this bit about uh, when I moved to the U.S. and worked in the U.S. for a few years, um, hmm. I had a very eclectic set of friends. Uh, yeah. Right from people from the LGBTQ community. Um, yeah. You know, people from um, my boss, I, I think I've told you this, um, yeah. over a period of a couple of months, uh, he became completely uh, disabled. His hands and legs had to be amputated. Right. So that exposure made me more aware. Um, and I then would constantly question when I came back to India as to why is it that we don't have friends beyond our mm. minds? No, I think, um, I would say I do. I do. It is human nature as well. Uh, sometimes we, and, and, and I've seen different facets of it, right? So 
I've seen to the point that I was making earlier on, you know, being curious and being, um, you know, being able to be courageous enough to have a con- uh, question and a conversation. Um, that's one part. Uh, the other part is, uh, you know, being too emotional with the problem so that you're not able to see through the solution. Oh, yeah. I've seen that as well. Um, and the third part is, you know, uh, the problem of perception, yeah. right? Uh, what will people think if I make this move? Or what will people think if I make the other? And mm. so on. Mm. And, and I see this even today. And I think the... Uh, the thing that I attribute it to is everybody's uh, life at the end of the day is uh, is something that they are also discovering, yeah. right? And their mindset and the presence of mind is not necessarily going to be the same thing for the same situation, even if they are at different times, right? Um, and... And we see this in our work as well. You know, let's take a very common scenario where, you know, we we have performed excellently in, in one year, but we probably don't get the ratings and the appraisals that we deserve, mm. right? Mm. And we, we realize that, hey, uh, you know, is this something that, you know, is a problem with me or is this something that, you know, I've been... Uh, 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 I, I haven't been appraised properly and, you know, how do I go about it? And I, I don't think it's it's got to do with, um, you know, uh, just people with disabilities. I think it's, it's also got to do with uh, just the way we think and the way we are at different points of time. Yeah. And which is where, um, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, are we doing enough? Um, and, and this is something that I tell myself every single time, that it's very easy to say that, here the government is not doing enough for infrastructure or, you know, the, somebody else is not doing so much for X, Y, Z. I just always point the finger back to me saying that, hey, am I doing enough to, you know, play even a small role in it at the end of the day, right? Um, can I, I may probably not have, uh, you know, the, the, the investments to kind of make a road accessible, but... Uh, can I talk to a few more people to say that, hey, how can you work around this road or, you know, how can you avoid danger and so on and so forth, right? So is there a role that I can play as an educationist or an evangelist yeah. versus, you know, uh, an engineer yeah. um, at the end of the day who can go and solve problems? Because I, I feel that the, the point that I was making earlier that, you know, um, often we think of a problem in isolation, um, but there are multiple ways of, you know, uh, tackling that problem. And sometimes we don't give enough time and credit to ourselves uh, to really go and explore that. Yeah. yeah. Shri, one uh, question I had over here mm-hmm. is um, when you face challenges uh, yeah. or adversity, it often reveals our own inner strength. It's like we discover yeah. it. Are there yeah. some specific standout instances where it's really shaped you completely different from where you were headed? No, that's a very good question. And I'll tell you, um, the conversation that we are having today is probably not something that uh, you know I would have had ever before. Because... Every conversation that I have just, you know, makes me think about my life and the past yeah. in different ways, right? Uh, you know, I, I may not have necessarily spoken about the resilience of my parents in a way that I did. Uh, I would have probably spoken about their role as a support system earlier rather than, you know, them being very resilient mm-hmm. uh, in that sense. So, um when I think about my life again, uh, you know, there are a few instances that, that come to mind. Um, one is the aspect around Braille that I spoke about, right? So, again, it was a very conventional way of, uh, you know, thinking about if it's somebody who is blind, they need to look at Braille as a script or as a language that they need to learn. Mm. and uh, you know and it was very 
easy for me to just you know bite my lip and you know spend that time and get it done and get it learned but that wasn't giving me joy at that time yeah and do i regret it at the end of it yes i did have that moment of that near term thing that hey i should have probably on the hindsight i should have just learned it for some more time and you know i could have probably aided me but look at it now uh, you know there is uh, you can do you can get notes generated on um, meeting recordings right so uh, i at, at at different points of my life i've realized that um the alternatives that you choose and the alternatives that i have chosen make it work to the best ability at your end and make it work to the best capability at the uh, you know at the technology side like when i work with screen readers i'm like uh, you know i don't need a braille document anymore because i, I i'll do um, you know work with the screen reader to the best i can and the best it can deliver yeah right and that has completely replaced the way i would look at it. the second aspect i think is um, something that came to me um you know something that hit me very late in life right and and uh, this is around mobility you know just learning to walk with a cane mm. and here again you know there was somebody who uh, a special educator who uh, when i was in the 7th or the 8th grade was you know uh, came home and she said that hey you need to learn this and so on and at that time i didn't accept my disability i didn't and it was difficult to accept it possibly because i was in an in- integrated school mm-hmm. right where i saw people doing things in the normal way that they would do yeah. and i wanted to be that yeah. and i didn't give myself to really go out and say that hey you know i i i need to learn things in a different way because it is going to help me i i didn't have that understanding when i was in the eighth grade and because of which i didn't learn and the 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 impact of that was that when i was in college uh for during junior college and senior college i had to depend on my parents and my friends to really you know help me get around to different places i eventually learned uh walking with a cane and you know just being completely independent when i when i was 21 or 22 right just before i was joining uh, an mba college now i'll tell you the the challenge with that is not that he you know you always had the support system so you know you could afford to do that mm. but you know the the downfall of that when i look back at it is i could have probably done so much more by depending on people way more lesser during my college time probably you know would have found a job and you know done some internships and you know could have explored so much more and you know which i which i probably didn't uh, this thing so that is where i i whenever there is a suggestion um, you know there on which has come to me saying that hey, you know you could probably look at this you could probably look at that i i don't shut it down anymore yeah. i i keep a very open mind on uh, saying that hey uh, there is merit in thinking through it there is merit in exploring it maybe it's not helping me right now but you know you never know and and that's where it opened my eyes to uh this whole point that i was making on uh there is there is never a a problem that is unsolved and there is never a bad solution yeah. right something or this, yeah. something or some you know something will help or something will fit the puzzle somewhere shri i don't know if you remember this i i think i've told you this uh, my uh journey towards expressing myself is because mm-hmm. of you uh <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah yeah so I, i when we were working together that ai yeah. uh, bit with rohini um i remember you yeah. wanted me to write about uh, that particular yeah. uh yes. blog um about the ai intent that we were working on and i think i sat right. on it for almost two months and how persistently you came back and it was not like you were pushing me every time yeah. you're trying to figure out where am i procrastinating why am i procrastinating yeah. and yeah. here i am today sitting and talking to you i think one thing i want to ask you is like learning mm. we all have our own choice points when it comes to communicating yeah. as well 
you know yeah. uh, we use our own channels um it could be chat it could be the phone it mm. could be in person um it could right. be tweets and so on and so forth how did you go about discovering that part interesting um i never give it a thought to be honest it just came to me i just moved from one thing to the other um but you know i think now that i'm thinking about it uh you know the i i i was always um closer to voice as uh, this thing and i think it's probably because of you know a lot of uh, uh commentary and uh, you know the the auditory signals that i picked up um you know through different um, phases of my life right from you know the the early cricket commentators to harsha bogle now and you know um all of that and also looking at you know what else can i do with voice uh uh you know whether it is uh, mimicking somebody or imitating somebody or you know is it is it just kind of you know working through different accents and so on and so forth so i think um it just came naturally to me um i was always a uh, i was always curious uh, to read more and then build perspectives and tr- always try to match one thing to the other which would uh, you know and and the way i would look at a creative output of that would be in you know certain written pieces whether it's a blog or it's a, it's just a poem to myself and you know so on um and i think when i finished my um whenever when i finished my schooling um as i was always into the extracurricular mode so literary arts performing arts uh, fine arts is something that i never got to because i i, I couldn't figure out you know uh, how to draw a Uh, how to draw or how to paint very well mm. but literary and performing arts have always been those um, you know comfort corners for me all through my college even mba for that matter and you know very interestingly uh, during my mba i was not necessarily the gold medalist or the rank holders or anything of that sort that you would generally associate with you know um, people moving into a tier 1 um, institution for doing their mba but you know i was always this thing again uh, you know that whole aspect of uh, finding one's space in the context of where you are right uh, that kind of kicked in again when i joined mb and i said that you know there are so many intelligent people around and there are so many people who have uh, you know who are probably fantastic at statistics or probably fantastic at uh, you know financial management and so on you know what is my space and that is where i kind of you know found comfort in the whole literary and the performing arts side of it where i said that you know somebody may have a very beautiful presentation but you know the story doesn't come alive till you deliver it mm. and um again you know that that got me to you know uh, landing a lot of presentations you know having interesting anecdotes to you know light up those presentations and so on so i think that kept me going um and and i'm i'm really kind of thankful to everybody who gave me that space and you know the exposure at at different points of time and even after coming to microsoft um you know uh, my my uh, for for the last few years that i've been here uh that's one of the spaces that i really you know build on to say that hey how can i uh you know build more on my capability to deliver a story whether i am doing it for a product i'm doing it for my team i'm doing it for um you know a program or an occasion and at the same time how can i help somebody build a good story and i and i've kind of realized this uh, especially in the last uh, you know couple of years is the more you have conversations on someone else's projects right um the clarity that you bring to yourself and that other person is invaluable absolutely because it's not just the perspective that you add to that problem it is also you know how you're making somebody else think mm. right uh, and, and and i love that process of you know how it kind of you know has a rub off effect on you as well and and the second thing that i um, 
you know uh, i've i've learned um, just in the, in that in that space of building clarity is uh, writing things down right um um uh, i would never rehearse or you know um do a script walk through uh if i'm comparing an event for example right because that is not something that comes naturally to me mm. but i would always jot down important points that i need to bring in if i'm briefing a team or if i'm you know uh, landing a presentation to say that hey these are the four points i need to have how i deliver it i will leave it to time and whatever i have acquired over a period of time mm. and but the whole point is people are here to listen to these four things and these are the four things or four to five things that will create the differentiator so i'll always jot that down when i do when i work with my teams on the agency side um i i i would spend a lot of time on sharpening the brief to them mm. because especially in the creative world um you know as one of my uh, friends would say that the output is as good as the input right yeah. so Abhijan how Abhijan. do you make, yeah and how do you make sure that you know you have the right material going in so that you can enable somebody else to come up with the right material to serve you better at mm-hmm. the end of the day yeah so i know it's it's been a long uh, this thing but it's 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 always been you know like i i cut across it's not that one thing led to the other it's 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 very it's it's like a parallel universe you know <laughs> yeah. always conspiring to make me do something yeah. yeah one thing i noticed uh working with you was when you walk into a room hmm. you own the space there's an energy you that you walk in with and yeah. inherently you earn that space and that is not an entitled space that you earn but it's a mm. beautiful you know it's an open space where people want yeah. to come in as well yeah how is that how did you evolve into that to be very honest i never thought of that and thank you for what you said because i i don't think anyone has put it in the way you've done it um and i still don't know if i do a good job of that or not mm-hmm. but the way i approach any conversation whether it is a, in a large gathering or even a meeting with two people or it's a meeting with you know a very small room etc is i value time right i value people's time um i'm truly appreciative of you know people wanting to hear something from me and the opportunity that they've given me to whether it's 5 minutes or whether it's 30 minutes i don't care my whole thing is um you know as stand up comedians would call it they've given you a slot you need to go and kill it yeah right so um and a lot of times um i struggle as well right um and i struggle in spaces where i'm probably uh, you know the the least knowledgeable or you know uh, probably somebody who who doesn't know the space that well like I'll, i'll give you a very simple example you know i get lost when i go to attend people's weddings right i don't know what to do <laughs> you know what conversation to have yeah. beyond you know the initial greetings and the pleasantries i really don't know what to do yeah but in the places in the professional sphere specifically is uh i look at what is the value that i can add for people out there uh i respect people's time uh i always look for things that you know people would want to that will make people open up mm. a bit right and it need not be experiences it could be uh you know something that 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 just happened to them the day before or it could be something that uh this thing so the the way i look at my role in any conversation is of an instigator right uh how do i uh you know help people tell their stories so um i i generally look at every opportunity as a as an opportunity to connect with people um and and a lot of the energy that i bring into the room 
is from the energy that people give me back. And I think you would hear this from a lot of live performers where the, uh, a lot of musicians as well, specifically, where they talk about, they get a lot of energy from the crowd, right? Yeah. No, I think for me, I, I, here's another thing you've constantly done. You know, when I took the plunge from the corporate world to yeah. this journey as Attitude Makeover, with Attitude yeah. Makeover, you constantly called me, whether it's the blogs, the podcast, and you're like, I love this, I love this. Maybe here's another thought. I've, I've checked this. You should check out this podcast. It was yeah. in some ways... I knew you were holding space for me, first thing. Yeah. I knew you're coming from the right, you mean well for me. Yeah. And those uh, inputs you were giving me were like a constant, it's like that, you know, your support system you talk about. Yeah. These are good support systems to have, which is constantly trying to get better and better and become better for yourself. Yeah. And you need people like this who come back and give you these insights and you've been that for me throughout these last one and a half years and yeah. uh, I've always wondered how you hold that space when you walk in and uh, no, thank you so much for just being you in this whole process. No, I, and, and to be very honest, I enjoy doing that um, and I enjoy doing that because of, uh, you know, possibly I, I haven't gotten enough feedback and I crave for feedback all the time. If there is something that I genuinely crave all my life is feedback, is you know somebody coming up and saying that, hey, this didn't go well, can you do a certain thing better like this? I always keep asking that. So Sri, this entire conversation we had, um, I think the intent was to really keep it unscripted. At the same time, walk through how one could sort of define a strategy for life for yourself yeah. and I think uh, yeah. you beautifully walked us through the most important aspects whether it's what's the core strength or your values that you bring to the table how do you learn how do you grow in this process um, you know what channels of communication do you use um, and the process of that uh, and who becomes, what becomes your partnerships, whether it's the tools, the people, yeah. all of these. And I think it was beautiful in how we, you led me through this conversation to sort of define a strategy for one's life. And uh, I have a bunch of, you know, regular questions now that I normally ask my guests. Um, first one, Sri, is when the night uh, falls, and all title fades. Who are you truly? A curious conversationalist who always wants to learn more. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And what does attitude makeover mean to you? Um, it's a work in progress to discover and rediscover your authentic self, right? Because we go through this insane number of phases through our lives um, and environments which require different level of tooling or you know the, the change in tooling every single time but what doesn't change is who you are and what you bring uh, to every conversation so i think how do you make sure that happens is what attitude makeover is to me i love it love it Last one, Sri. Um, if you were to sort of part with a certain set of mantras that you live by, that you would like to share um, with anybody who is watching this, listening to this, what would that be? I think especially the place where I come from, where I do digital and social media for my living, um, I would say there is a lot of noise and too many voices out there. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that would help anybody succeed is uh, when they hear, when they, when they just pause and hear their own voice, because you will get a lot more perspective, but the perspective that will hold you in good stead is always what you derive or where you land at. Um, 
and make that as a purpose uh, when you do soul searching or when you're seeking for something always seek for that as you know that's your purpose at the end of the day and once you're true to that purpose uh, you will deliver more than what you know uh, what you thought you would i love it love it so you mentioned during the conversation that you're into mimicry tabla can you do something um i don't know if i'm violating copyrights <laughs> to be honest um been out of touch for a very long time but let me give this a shot this is jeffrey boycott um an english player from 1970s who has been an illustrious commentator and an opinion writer on cricket uh for a long time and he would have this um special affection for saurabh ganguly the ex indian captain and the bcci president and uh, this is how we would go about it you know what they played is absolute rubbish i would really not like anybody to take the game for granted nobody is bigger than the game and the way they bowled today was you know my mama could bowl better right so he, he had this um strong yorkshire accent and you know uh, was was very straightforward uh would never hold back on anything very generous with his criticism yeah i have never seen this side of you i clearly missed this part in the last four years that i worked with you <laughs> yeah we didn't get that many opportunities to show off you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shri, awesome. uh, thank you so much. Wonderful conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed enjoyed yeah. every bit of this. Um, whenever you're in Bangalore, would love to host you, spend Absolutely. time with you, stay connected. And again, thank you so much. Man. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you Sajanya. This was lovely. Uh, I, I enjoyed doing this. Thank you so much for having me. All the best. <laughs>